shame. Dear Heavenly Father, we're, we're grateful to see progress on this pandemic thing and have more people involved now in person and in Zoom together and just hope this will be a, an opportunity for greater outreach. And as we study tonight, we pray this will be a greater opportunity for us to grow better at loving you and loving our fellow man. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, all right, well, welcome. Um, a lot of you in the auditorium here have not been a part of this class. We've been going through the spiritual disciplines and with the, the, the mind to enhance our spirituality, to enhance our Christ-likeness, uh, to be more godly. And, and that's the goal of the spiritual disciplines. That's what most of the authors who write about these talk about the fact that they are not an end unto themselves. They are a way in which we can grow closer to Christ. The, the goal is to help us be better Christians, to be better people. And so that's, that's the goal of these as we, as we move through them. The other thing I have to do is... We have two theme verses for the quarter. One is Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We, as we develop our Bible study, as we develop our prayer lives, as we develop uh, the concept of submission in our lives or solitude or worship, as we're looking at today, any of these spiritual disciplines, as we develop these, we become more free. We become um, freer in Jesus Christ, not only free from sin, but free from all the things of this fallen world that trap us and, and bring us down. And then the other theme verse we've had uh, for the quarter is Psalm 42, uh, verses uh, 1 and 2, and then verse 5. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So we move to, uh, wow, week nine. And we have gone through some of the inward disciplines of prayer and Bible study, and we focused in intently on prayer in the month of December. And then for the last month, we've been looking at some of the outward disciplines, simplicity, solitude, submission, and service. And today we get to worship and confession. Got someone else in here? All right. So one of the first things we need to realize with worship is that God is seeking worshipers. And of course, he's seeking worshipers in the same way that he has always sought out his people. We think back to the, the Garden of Eden, and God comes into the garden after Adam and Eve have caused the fall, with a capital F, and where are you, he asked. And this is not the first time God has sought people out, of course. God is a seeker. He wants his people back, even when they sin. And that's the whole story of redemption. That's the whole story of what Jesus did on the cross for us, him uh, seeking us, moving to us to bring us back to him. Uh, John 4 says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship, the woman of the well. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God has always been a seeker. John, uh, uh, God has always been a seeker. John 6.44 no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then John 12, uh, 28 specifically, but 27 to 36, uh, Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. 
Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. And so as we dive into the discipline of worship and a little bit on confession right at the end, uh, we, we realize that, that this is God's desire for us. All these things that we do to try to be closer with God, and however you define that, in your relationship with him, whether it's whether you like to focus on the spirit and talk about being more spiritual or having a greater spirituality, focus on Christ. I want to be more Christ-like. I want to do what Jesus would have done in this situation or say what he would have said in this situation or to simply be more godly. They're all three saying the same thing, but just know that this is, this is what God wants for us. This is what God wants for you. He wants us to be moved in his direction. So, Susan, go ahead in just a second. Let me put the mic up near the thing so you can, uh, so the people in here can hear. No need to put the mic up. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I could, something, I <laughs> go ahead. Something I'm wrestling with that was said or just trying to reconcile in my head is when Jesus was at the well and he was talking to, I think it was what, the Samaritan lady or mm -hmm. lady? Yep. Okay. And he's pointing out two physical places that that time they would go to worship at right um and he's yeah. saying that that's happening now but there'll be a time where that won't basically be and that she would worship in truth and spirit so my head goes to he's comparing a physical place that was normal for that time and then in the future that physical place will not be required to go to but that it would be more in a spiritual sense with truth so i wanted to see what your thoughts are on that based off of that point in time to where we're at now uh the i'll try to i'm trying to go back to where that was um, and then I'll do it for those of you in here as well. Uh, it's easier in here. Um, he, they, they had their uh, regulations and, and their rules, and according to the old law, of course. And I don't think, Jesus is not implying that the people, that the Jewish people didn't, that, that God didn't want them to worship truthfully, or sincerely, he's not, he's not implying that they didn't, that that wasn't a desirable thing back then. Um, but the shift definitely is happening with Christ from more of a physical emphasis to a spiritual emphasis. I'm, I'm going to mention it as we move through the lesson that we, we can't forget the physical things <laughs> for sure, but Jesus just he really added what they should have been doing all along, even when he talked about in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you've heard that it was said, do not uh, commit adultery, but I say don't lust. It doesn't mean God wanted that he didn't mind people lusting, you know, from Adam and Eve, you know, down to the time of Christ. It's just Jesus made, he fulfilled the law. He made it more full. He made it more whole. He made it more the way it was supposed to be. And the same will be true and is now, of course, with worship. The the physical location mattered, the tabernacle mattered, the temple mattered, but now we are the temple. And so, of course, Jesus knows the shift is occurring, that it's, it's happening. And so I think that's what he's getting at. Again, not that they didn't have to be truthful, and I don't think you were implying that anyway with what you were saying, but just 
a, a shift to a more spiritual mindset, if you will. And um, anyone else want to add to that? Um, may, may I just clarify for a moment on that? Yeah, yeah, so my, sure. my, my focus wasn't about the truth portion of that. Okay. The um, focus was about that in spirit and the thought when somebody becomes a Christian, that the, the term worship is that, I think we may have talked a little bit about in the past, about it's a prostrate, prostrating position from the throne. So the spirit of the person is able to worship 24 seven because their spirit is prostrated before the throne in worship. And so that's possibly why Jesus said, Hey, this time at this point, you guys are basically, this would be paraphrasing the physical type of thing where you're going to a, to these specific places, but there'll be a time where you'll be doing this act with in spirit and truth. Thus the, the part about the spirit aspect of that, that is more of that spirit. It becomes a spiritual worship mm -hmm. um, in, in that aspect. Yeah. And we're, we're going to talk about some of those words in a little bit as well. And the, um, and the difference between the 24 seven worship in our gathering. So, because there are definitely okay. different things being talked about in, in the New Testament sometimes. But here, I, I, I think you are grasping this. Does anyone else want to add anything, either here or online, to, uh, to what Susan was asking about? Okay. All right. Susan, are you satisfied? She already okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I'm good with um, okay. what you said in the moment and that whatever you'll be saying down the road. Um, I'll be interested to hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ron was pointing out that they have, and of, of course, he may have mentioned this in his John class, um, that they did have those two different places. And Jesus is saying, you won't have to worry about that, you know, uh, in a little while. Of course, the very next verse is where he confesses that he is the Christ right after where we ended. But of course, that's too emotional for me. So I stopped before that. <laughs> so... So God wants us to worship. That's, that's our first little bit. He is drawing us to him in every way. He wants to save us. He wants us to worship. He is, he is the mover. He is the one that is the cause of why we worship at all. So therefore, uh, we worship uh, God, of course. Uh, Matthew 4, 8 through 10, Jesus is being tempted. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And so our lives become a worship, a service, a dedicated, we become a dedicated vessel to God. We become the actual sacrifice. We die to self. We take up our crosses daily. We say to our wills, you know, get behind me, Will. I want to have uh, God's will only. Uh, that's what I want to embrace in my life. And so we worship God. We worship God alone. And anytime we, we lose our focus on who God is, Father, Son, and Spirit, the entirety of God, uh, the Almighty God, when we lose focus of that, we're going to be off in some way. Uh, the, our view of God, our view of Christ uh, is central to how we're going to live our lives. And we want to worship him only. Okay, Ron, he's bolstering the numbers. He's sitting in the back and he's logging in on Zoom. <laughs> Just giving you a hard time. <laughs> All right, so some ideas for preparation for worship. Um, um, and this is where I do wanna talk about the, the difference uh, between uh, the idea of the 24 seven worship and our gathering, an assembly of worshipers. Now, in, in a sense, there isn't a whole lot of difference. Our whole lives are dedicated to God. But in another sense, you know, there, there's a huge difference. There's a time that we're supposed to come together as the body of Jesus Christ and, and worship the Lord together. And so we have, we have two different concepts here in the New Testament. As a discipline, as something that we are using to grow in our spirituality, we want to make sure both of these concepts are, are real in our lives. 
we don't want to lose sight of either one. The, the gathering of God's people together was, was vital. In fact, you know, we're told, do not forsake the assembly. Uh, we, want to, we, we want to be together, the, the assembled ones. We want to come together. And this was, again, just vitally important uh, for Christians. And I think all of you sitting in here tonight, it's obviously important to you. And it's important to everyone online. We want to be together. We want fellowship. We want this unity that comes when we worship the Lord together. It is an amazing and beautiful thing. So we want that, but we also want our very lives. We want to be living sacrifices. We've looked at that uh, verse several times this quarter. I've got it in the slides again for tonight, Romans 12, uh, verse 1. And we really want and strive for that, to be the people that God uh, wants us to be. So the, the life of worship or the life of service, the life of dedication, the life of sacrifice will help us to do a better job on the Lord's Day when we come together uh, to worship corporately. There, there are a lot of things um, in, in prepping for this where, you know, well, I'll just, I'll jump ahead uh, because we may run out of time anyway for the confession part. The, and of course, we use that word two different ways too. The, the discipline, the, the, the spiritual discipline of confession is actually confessing our sins uh, to one another, actually making a confession of evils, of, of bad works as opposed to good works. And that's something that is, is linked with fellowship. That's something that's part of, you know, we, you know, and I'm not suggesting we have several elders. I'm not suggesting we have um, a fellowship meal where all we do is confess sins. <laughs> but I think that would be kind of a downer. But, uh, but maybe not. Maybe we would all really grow from that. But anyway, but it does have a lot to do with fellowship. Uh, when, the, when the saints would come together, this was part of what they were supposed to do. Again, not on the Lord's Day. We're not given a, it's not a part of our worship per se, but it's linked with fellowship. It's linked with the coming together. Um, it's hard to confess your sins to someone else if you're not at least with them on the phone. So uh, there's a, a strong link there. And so this, this assembly, when they would come together, I don't know, the early church, if, if in the lobby before or after, not that they had lobbies, but if they would, you know, if, if it was normal for them to confess sins to one another, or if it was just an occasional thing, you know, we, we don't know, we can't go back, but we do know that we're commanded to do it. And that's one of the places where I think we tend to be a little weak on uh, something the Bible says to do and, and whether or not we do it. But that's kind of just a side point. But this point here is, let's make sure we have both things going on in our lives. Let's make sure that we live a life of sacrifice, a life of dedication, a life of worship and service, and that we don't get confused with, you know, that that's not an excuse. I have a friend um, who, you know, she, she, uh, she won't come to worship, and it's because it's because the fields are white for harvest and I need to be out on the Lord's battlefield. I don't need to be in a church building for an hour. I need to be out preaching the gospel. And um, I mean, yeah, that's great. <laughs> but I don't think that an hour, you know, again, I mean, that's just not what we need to do. Um, we need balance in our lives. Uh, we need to engage ourselves in all the different ways that God wants us to engage ourselves. And part of that is a gathering on the Lord's day to worship uh, God. So um, any, any comments? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Let me get my little it, mic set up here. Go ahead. Just a question. You mentioned about confessing your sins one to another um, and that being found in the Bible. Now I can only think of it being in one place, James 5, 15, and 16, is that kind of where you're at? Or yeah, you no, in yeah. mind? And, and linked with healing there, of, of, you know, they really yeah. did, they, they, they had that concept in their mind that, you know, if, if you're sick, you must have sinned. They still had that embedded so deep within them, really amazing. Um, but yeah, you're probably right. That may, be, that may be one of the only places. So anything else on that, George, that you wanted to add? Uh, no, just making sure I was with you. Okay, okay, yeah, very good. All right, anyone else? All right.
All right, so here's our Romans 12.1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And that, that word there, uh, a lot of translations say service, uh, your, your spiritual service or worship, it, they, both, they both fit, especially if we're thinking about worship in the, in, the, um, in the right way. So here I just want to do our comparison. We've looked at this a few times this quarter, um, uh, the comparison of these two lists. There are tons of lists of spiritual disciplines. Um, the um, uh, the uh, corporate disciplines, and then uh, Willard separates them out. The, the disciplines where we actually deprive ourselves of something, um, his first seven, and then his last eight are things where you are not withholding something from yourself, but engaged in something, whereas uh, Foster uh, talks about the inward disciplines, then the outward, and then the corporate uh, disciplines, the ones you do together. And confession is one of the ones, again, where you do it together. And obviously worship is. Uh, we, we come together and we worship uh, together uh, the Lord. So uh, preparation uh, for worship. Uh, several different things here that uh, I found that I think were neat. And we find these uh, scripturally as well. Um, the idea of an expectation. The Jews would come together uh, we've been studying Nehemiah, but the same thing is true in Ezra as well and other places in the Old Testament. There was an expectation when the people would come together. Um, and, and the expectation was a true one. I mean, they knew that someone was going to read the word. They knew that there was going to be a proclamation, that there was going to be a reading or maybe something new from one of the prophets. Uh, of course, when Moses came off the mountain, you know, here we go. And then after 40 years of wandering, once everyone died off, then we have Deuteronomy. Moses repeats the word, uh, the law again. And so there was an expectation. So that can help us too with worship to, to develop an expectation. You know what? I'm going to go Sunday or I'm going to watch online, you know, whichever. I'm going to go and I expect, you know, just a good mental attitude. I expect to give myself to the Lord and I expect to have fellowship with my brothers and sisters, and I expect to grow. The primary purpose in the corporate worship, of course, is to glorify God, but he's given us tons of blessings, side blessings, so to speak, that come out of worship, and so we should go in with an expectation that I am going to be encouraged. I'm going to be uplifted. I'm going to be uh, moved, and I don't mean moved necessarily in an emotional way, but sometimes we are in an emotional way, but I'm going to be engaged in this and it's going to make uh, a difference uh, for me. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Hi, yes. Um, curiosity of, yeah. in the yeah. Old Testament, they had the synagogue where they would go and get educated and get the readings, I believe, right? And then well, they went Yeah, to the synagogue kind of developed between the Old and New Testament. But yeah, you're, you're before Christ, yes. That, that yes, so you had this... Uh, and then you had the temple, which was a different place for a different purpose, right? Yes. And so which yes, one did they, which one did they worship in, the synagogue or the temple? Well, the, um, it, it was the, the moving temple was the tabernacle. And then, right. then it was the temple. And then the synagogues, we don't have any real talk of that in the Old Testament because they, they kind of came to be. Uh, between the Testaments. Um, and, but then that's where Paul would go. Paul would go to the synagogue to, you know, find the Jews and try to convert them. Right. And he would be on his missionary journeys. Um, and so the synagogues became the place of worship and learning and teaching, um, especially for those who couldn't get to Jerusalem or when, you know, there were times when the temple, you know, wasn't there in Jerusalem. Uh, Greg, do you want to add anything to that? Or Okay. into the intertestamental period, so much so that it refers to uh, Jesus opening his earthly ministry as
as going to the synagogue on uh, Sabbath, as was his custom. Yeah. And that was just a regular uh, way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But it did not take the place of the temple. Service. Okay, okay. Could, could you hear that, Susan? By I heard part of it. I okay. heard part of it. He was basically, Greg was uh, enhancing, he, he, he was agreeing with what I was saying, but then enhancing that and actually and pointing out that the, um, the, the commanded place of worship never changed from the temple, but actually during the exile earlier than I was thinking, uh, synagogues started and then flourished up until the time of Christ. And Greg pointed out that the, um, that Jesus, his earthly ministry, you know, began with him uh, going to the synagogue, and it says, as was his custom. So Jesus, you know, definitely was not against these synagogues, uh, even if it wasn't the direct, you know, the, the, even if it wasn't the direct temple uh, worship. So does that help some? Take that as a yes. <laughs> Where did he go? Where did he go when his parents left? And he was like, don't you know, I have to be where my father where, was that the temple uh, or the synagogue? Temple. It was the temple. It was the temple. Okay. So, yeah, because they, they, so it must have been uh, uh, there in Jerusalem. Okay. And it was Thank really close to Jerusalem as they were heading back home. He, that's where he got uh, uh, left. So, all right. Yes. Thank you. Oh, no problem. No problem. So another thing we can do to prepare ourselves for worship is to be involved in contemplation. We, um, it was, um, Matt Vega or Justin Rogers, actually it was, it was during the open forum, wasn't it, that they talked about meditation. And, um, and, and this is good for us. This is a practice that would be you know, very good for us to enhance in our lives, and as, especially the idea of allowing God to speak to us. And, and, and not just a quick reading, but you know, just a few verses and then meditate, think about those and pray back to God. And we've, we've talked a lot about that contemplative kind of prayer and the back and forth with God, which of course, is, is always positive, but to get ready for worship, that's good. And then several different authors talked about observation, and what they meant by this is, and I think we do a good job of this with our brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, in non-COVID times especially, um, but we do, I think we do a great job in the lobby before church and after church and in here before and after. I think, and what they're getting at is observe the other Christians, observe the other worshipers, and part of coming together, part of the assembly, part of the gathering is for the purpose of uplifting each other. If someone comes in and, and looks like they need some attention, give them some attention. Even if it means kind of stepping back from your contemplation and your meditation or whatever you might want to do to be ready for worship, that the fellowship concept and the care for each other concept is, is super important in worship as well. So I think I, I think that's just a neat idea, so I wanted to throw that in there. And then uh, Greg kind of got at this Sunday when he was uh, leading us at the Lord's table, um, the, the mystical union of the saints. And we're not talking mystical as in Halloween-y, um, but we're talking that there's a spiritual reality that sometimes we miss. We are one with all people who are Christians. We, we are one with the other members of the body of Christ. And Jesus has said, where two or three are gathered, I will be with you. So in our gathering, Christ in a special way is here. We, Christ is always with us through the Spirit. Uh, that's just, you know, he said, you know, I need to go back to the Father so the Father can send the Spirit. And of course, we receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. And there's an individual aspect to the indwelling of the Spirit, and there's a church-wide aspect of his indwelling and his being our seal. But Jesus will be there. And so when we worship, there's, there, and, and not, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name, that, that's, you know, right now I would consider that we are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. He'll be there. And so there's an aspect to preparing for worship in realizing Jesus, Jesus is here. And not that we wouldn't think he is, but, but in a special way, he is with us. And that's, that's really, really important. With, with all the different things on worship, and I think we uh, would feel that this is totally biblical, but these earthly writers that have written about it, uh, the, this mystical, this spiritual side of it, the, the, the side of it that we can't see with our eyes and hear with our ears, um, 
it's just as real. And it's important for us to recognize as we prepare for worship. And then, of course, as we are uh, worshiping, uh, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Very, very amazing. The leader of worship is always Jesus Christ himself. Um, so we, we enter into his gates, uh, Psalm 100. And we're going we're gonna to sing. I've got three songs in here. I don't know if we'll have time for all three. Uh, but um, uh, you can guess which song we're going to sing with this one. Uh, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So let's take a moment and uh, uh, sing this. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. All right, great job on a Wednesday night. First Wednesday night, we've sung a song in 10 months, 11 months, whatever it is. All right, so uh, to enter his gates, a few uh, uh, bullet points here. Um, and again, these are kind of prep things that we can think about during the week. And then as we come into worship, uh, learn to practice the presence of God daily. And, you know, we, we're told to pray continuously pray without ceasing, but there is still a time when we bow our heads and we say, dear God, and we put an amen at the end. So we have both concepts with prayer. And again, to get back to several slides ago, we have the same concept with worship. There's a sense in which we are to live this life of worship, but then there's a time that we deliberately, and again, as a body, come together and worship him. But as we get ready for that, let's, let's keep in mind that sacrificial life that we are to live, that dedicated life. Um, you know, we, we don't just dedicate something, we dedicate ourselves. We are the sacrifice. We are the thing that's being given to the Lord because of what he gave for us. We love him because he first loved us. It's all in response, whether it's our life or our corporate worship on the Lord's day, it's all in response to what God has done. And of course, primarily, in Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, learn to praise God in different ways. And I'm not, that's not some kind of crazy talk um, uh, from the guy up here behind the podium. But just when, when you're driving, learn to praise God while you're driving. It'll, it'll make you calmer. I know from experience, if I'm thinking about God instead of those crazy drivers around me, I'm better off. Um, look at nature, look at the people in your life. In just a moment, um, there's going to be one, I'll just uh, give it away. Spoiler. Um, if there's a distraction, praise God even for the distraction. You know, we're supposed to thank God for everything. Um, even if there's a distraction, just praise God for that. You know, hey, I'm, I'm glad that that family has the healthy baby that's screaming two pews back or, you know, whatever the distraction is, you know, turn it into a blessing as opposed to uh, being frustrated by it. And the same is true in life, not just in the uh, assembly of the saints. Allow it to be something where you turn the focus back uh, to God. Um, look forward to the Lord's Day. We've talked about this already, but, but be ready. Expect something um, and expect to give something. Um, submit to one another in Christ. Again, putting others' interests ahead of our own. I mean, we could look at a, a ton of scriptures where this is true. Well, let's make it, not that it can be more true, but let's, let's up our engagement in those statements in scripture when we come together to worship. Let's submit even more. Let's make the other people even more important than they are 
uh, day by day in our lives. And of course, submit to God wholeheartedly, absorb distractions with gratitude, already mentioned that, and um, offer yourself sacrificially. And this is, it's not literal, it's not just literally the bottom of these of the list, but it really is the bottom line, whether we're talking about worship on a daily basis or the coming together worship that we do with the body of Christ, we are to be these living sacrifices. We are to put God number one and then uh, give ourselves fully to him, taking up our crosses, dying to self. And it's not easy all the time, but it's, it's something we are, we are called uh, to do. Uh, go ahead, Donna. This is Donna Williams for those of you in here. Um, this reminds me, oh, yes. This yeah, reminds me of um, the song, All to Jesus I Surrender. Yeah. You know, I can't remember the last verse, but the last verse is so good. You know, it is. I have to give my all. I can't yeah. remember what it is either, but I know it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it talks about, you know, giving all. All I can do is give my all or something I have to think about. Yeah, you know, and we have, you know, give my all. We, we have so many songs. We, we need to do a song service sometime where... We just sing all the songs that talk about all in all, uh, giving our all, because it's, it's more, we, I think we have eight or 10 songs that we could do for a song service. Um, all to Jesus, I Surrender, you know, again, and, and just a lot of those songs that talk about our all. Um, anyone, in, just, anyone in here have anything? On here, they raise their hands and I could, they unmute their mic so I can see. Here you can just uh, open your mask slightly and then I can know. Do you want to say something? All right, so let's see here. Uh, all right, Colossians 3, 15 and 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Uh, as Steve has suggested, I think we're going to do it in the summer, Steve. Steve has suggested a sermon series on the one another passages uh, in the New Testament, which there, there are tons. And here it doesn't say one another, but one body. This concept of our unity is so, so very strong. To which you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And I wanted to pull this up as we talk about worship, just to notice the parallelism uh, in, this, in this passage peace of Christ with word of Christ, ruling in your hearts, of course, the same concept as dwelling in you richly, and then, of course, the idea of thanksgiving. And these things will happen in worship, whether it's the daily or the, the Lord's Day worship. These things will happen as we give ourselves in service and worship uh, to uh, the Lord. So worship is not passive, and I think this is huge for us as well. Um, we it is active and it's physical. And, and just a side note, kind of a personal opinion, um, it's not explicitly stated this way in scripture, but, but I think the Lord's Supper is the way it is. I think there's a physical aspect to that. Well, we know it wasn't on accident. I think it was very purposeful because we are physical beings. We are spiritual, but we are physical. And I think, you know, the, the scriptures could have said, you know what, on the Lord's Day, and we could have even been given a time. I want you to spend five minutes meditating on the body of Christ, and I want you to spend 10 minutes contemplating the blood of Christ and all that those things mean. 15 minutes, a quarter hour. It could have been said like that. And of course, we would have done it. But it wasn't. It was, take this bread. This is my body given for you. Take this cup. This is my blood. And Greg emphasized the one cup of blessing. It's, it's one cup. It's one thing that we mystically, spiritually do with all other Christians uh, worldwide on the Lord's Day. Very, very important. So, so we, and it's the way we're set up and no complaints about how we're set up, but the way we're, you know, we're our seating arrangement for worship, you know, across the board, maybe across the world. When I see pictures from India, pictures from wherever. I mean, it's, it's benches, it's, it's rows. That's just what we are accustomed to. And so it lends itself into people thinking that they are the audience as opposed to audience of one 
uh, God Almighty. And so sometimes just because of our setup, we, we lose the mindset of being active in it. And so we just have to remind ourselves. I think most of us in the, in the Zoom room and most of us in here are pretty good at making sure we stay engaged. Uh, but let's help our kids. Let's help our grandkids. Let's help other people to, to really realize this prayer is the prayer for all of us, even though one person's leading it. Um, the Lord's Supper, obviously, that's more noticeably uh, corporate. The singing is, of course. But let's make sure we stay engaged and realize that, that this is a, a very active and physical thing. I do have uh, one quote from uh, one of our authors that I've been using, uh, Richard Foster. And Susan, this gets into some of the words. There are nine Hebrew words used for worship and eight Greek words. So I wasn't going to go through the 17 words, but... But you were correct last week, Susan, in saying that they almost every single one of them is a physical action word that has grown to mean the concept of worship as we know it. And he says this in, the, in his chapter, uh, the Bible describes worship in physical terms. The root meaning for the Hebrew word we translate worship is to prostrate. The word bless literally means to kneel. Thanksgiving refers to an extension of the hand. Uh, throughout scripture, we find a variety of physical postures in connection with worship. And so just, just a, a note here that, uh, that what you were thinking and, and what we all know, that these, these words, they, they are active words. Um, and so we need to keep that in mind and make sure that we don't uh, lose uh, sight of that. And this is a great song for this because this talks about some of these postures and how we realize, Susan, kind of like you said in your first comment tonight, we our hearts bow down. And maybe sometimes we literally do. Maybe you bow down next to your bed sometimes. Uh, but this talks about bowing down. It talks about lifting holy hands. So I thought this would be good to, to just take a note of the different postures and different ways and the action uh, that we might want to uh, be involved in. On bended knee I come. With a humble heart I come, bowing down before your holy throne. Lifting holy hands to you as I pledge my love anew. I worship you in spirit. I worship you in truth. Make my life a holy praise unto you. On bended knee I come. With a humble heart I come. Bowing down before your holy throne. Lifting holy hands to you as I pledge my love anew. I worship you in spirit. I worship you in truth. Make my life a holy praise unto you. All right, just a few more uh, things right here. Um, we um, normally with a Zoom class, we go to eight, but I don't know what you all are. You can just start walking out of here if you want. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, we're going to wrap up in a second. Another um, uh, quote from one of the other authors I've been using. I just thought this was really good. Uh, the study of God and his word and works opens the way for the disciplines of worship and celebration. In worship, we engage ourselves with, we dwell upon, and we express the greatness, beauty, and goodness of God. We do this alone as well as in union with God's people. To worship is to see God as worthy, to ascribe great worth to him. And he goes on to talk about when we don't view God in the right way, our worship and our lives in general diminish. But when we give God the glory, when we lift him up, when we exalt Jesus Christ, when we lift up the spirit, then we are better worshipers and we are better livers. And so I just thought that was really good. A couple uh, worship uh, scenes from Revelation. 
Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. In Revelation 5, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Uh, we, we have some great scenes of worship in the Bible and especially obviously, in Revelation. He wraps up this thought with, as we worship in this manner, giving careful attention to the details of God's actions and to his worthiness, the good we adore enters our minds and hearts to increase our faith and strengthen us to be as he is. You might have noticed at the end of On Bended Knee, the last line in the song talks about living life. You know, so the life we live will help enhance our corporate worship on the Lord's Day and if we worship well on the Lord's day, it will enhance our living through that week. It will lift us up and get us ready uh, for the next push in this fallen world. Uh, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feel the mind with the truth of God, feed the mind, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purpose of God. And I thought that was really great. I'm going to... Uh, uh, skip over the part on confession because this is a great place to kind of close out. Uh, David Moore, go ahead and make a comment. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was just going to say that before you did, that one enhances the other because if we're serving the Lord all week through everything we do at work and worshiping, like you said, during driving and and, you know, studying the Bible and then our corporate worship is just so much more powerful but there is a lot that i get out of uh you know worshiping the lord at a certain time and a certain fervence then that helps me get through the rest of the week so mm -hmm. yeah one yeah i just wanted to say that was a great comment well great and thank you david for always for your comments always appreciate them and uh, Richard Belleville, would you be willing to lead us in a closing prayer tonight? Get back. Yeah, let's all bow together. Okay, I'm back on again. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're good. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for a day of life that you've given us. We thank you for the many blessings we enjoy in this country. We thank you that we have learned of Jesus and learned how we might have a way with to live with you eternally. Father, help us to worship you more effectively. Help us to think upon these things. Forgive us of our sins. Guide us this week. We pray through Jesus' name. Amen.